because she's the keys to unlock those things. So are you ready for that? Yeah. Are you sure? Yeah. And that's a rhetorical question. You have to ask yourself that. Yes. But if you are, that's my gift to you. Wow. Okay. So unwrap the candle, take the label off, because some people get the candles and leave the label on and wonder why their house catches on fire. <laughs> and then ask the goddess for to please unlock the memory of where you come from, and she'll show it to you. And give thanks. All right, I will, I will do so. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. I also, I have made it a ritual to give my students a present. I think I started doing that. I don't know if it was in Vegas. I don't know when it was. But from now on, that's something I would like to do. So I'm going to call my students up. And I'm going to give you guys something very special. And I'd like for you to um, enjoy it. I'll tell you what it's about in a minute. Okay. Okay. By the way, she's Thank the you. best massage therapist in the world. Woo-hoo. Okay? Thank you. Here you go. Much. Okay, Thank you're welcome. Thank you. By the way, I'm hugging some energy into you because we're going to need it okay. for this ritual. So. All right. Thank you. Okay. Here you go. All right. Thanks. All right. Here you go. Emma's doing very well. She's on her. What cycle are you on right now, Emma? Five. Okay. Yeah, doing the thing. Great. The other part. Okay, and I'll explain what it is now. Okay. So. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I have to bring you to ask too. All right. I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay. All right. <laughs> Students, you're not a student. You are an initiate. There's a difference. Okay. It's all love, though. So what I've given to my students is an invitation to a festival that happens every year when a very good friend of mine, Gautama Buddha, comes back to this world and gives a gift of primordial light to the planet. He moved off of this planet after his ascension, and he lives in the domain of Shambhala, which is infinite perfection. It's not even something that we could really understand. But when he comes back in Tibet, there is a party that you cannot imagine how amazing it is. And what you have is an invitation to that festival, and it's called the Wezak Festival. Wezak, W-E-S-A-K. The funny part is, you can't get there in your physical body. You have to go in your ethereal body. Not your astral body, or your mental body, or your emotional body. It's very different. So I'm going to explain the ritual in public because you can't use it unless you have it. You don't have to go to the Wezak Festival. It's optional. It's my gift to you. It's an invitation. When the first time I went, I was blasted out of my body because I was so excited (laughs) that I could barely contain my senses. It was so exciting that I had to forget it. But the energy of being at the festival is something that will be a major gift to your emancipation from the human form. You will also meet in the... Ethereal flesh, because this is really a template of a finer version. So we are still humans on higher planes of reality. We still have the same form. You'll meet Kuan Yin. You'll meet Buddha. You'll meet all of the ascended masters who decide to go. You'll meet Sanat Kamara. You'll meet Hathor or Het Heru. And she's someone that, if it wasn't for her, she came from Venus about... Eight million years ago. How many of you know about Het Heru or Hathor? Okay. She's the one that gave the gift of what caused Eve's problem. Mm. The gods were very mad at her 
because she gave a gift to the cow. How many of you know what the gift is? The cow is venerated because of the gift that Hathor gave to the cows. Cows are worshipped as deity in Kemet and in India. That's for a very, 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 very good reason. And whenever you do that, you're honoring Hathor. But the question is, and maybe that'll be a homework assignment because I can't give it to you all, right? <laughs> what was that gift? I'll give you a clue, though. Hold on. I'll give you a clue. Nine months. That gift, no, wasn't that. It, that could be metaphorically a gift because nine months means birth, right? Yeah. So Eve was about to give birth to, you know, knowing things that she, the gods didn't want her to know. The clue is that the gift will cause you to know what the gods know. I know. I know you. I'll give you one crack at it. It's the, all right, the nectar, which is the milk that's from the Can I be frank? No. <laughs> <laughs> that's not it. It's a good try, though. The nectar comes from my mother... Lakshmi. Lakshmi. Okay. But that's not it. The Emrita is what you're talking about. That's not it. Anybody else want to take a crack? Okay, that'll be a homework assignment. Oh, Delicia, yes? Go for it. That's too easy. I mean, okay, the knowledge of good and evil, but that's not, that's what is produced as a byproduct of what Hathor gave to the cows to give to us. No, that's a good one. Yeah, that's two cracks. Okay. So, students, make sure, and everyone, you guys are in this hotel, correct? We're in the, the Holiday Inn, actually. The, how far is that from here? A good mile and a half. Okay, good. So, I have to make it a point of coming back tomorrow to bring you your elements. By the way, this is not something that you can give to anyone else. Has your name on it. Something happened in Las Vegas the last time. And it was an innocent thing. But I have to talk about it. Because it's something that is, uh, it pertains to all of us. When you get a ritual from me, it's not to be shared with anyone. If you buy a super candle, the candles have the spirit of the most high in it. It's not a candle, it's a ka and el. Candles are powerful for a reason. And taking a ritual, and this happened in Las Vegas, and like I said, it happened innocently. What happened was, we had, what had happened was, we have a beautiful group of initiates in Las Vegas, and someone had obtained the Mansa Musa ritual. I think Ray got it, and Tendris got it, and maybe two other people. Everybody else looked at it like, that's weird, I don't want that. <laughs> when I bring things, I bring them from the spiritual world into this existence, and the proof of it is the effect that it has on your life. So that validates what it is. And there were some people that wanted to take the ritual and share it, and they didn't let me know about it. I found out about it through one person. You know who you are. <laughs> so I said, okay, well, thank you for sharing. And I explained to that person that the ritual, how is the ritual going to work if you don't have the ritual? If you don't have the elements? So that's like a woman saying, can I borrow your bra, but you just give her the strap and not the cups? <laughs> it's not going to have the desired outcome that you want it to have. And that should be common sense, shouldn't it? Yeah. If I lend you my socks, the socks don't belong to you. You eventually will have to give it back. Therefore, you're not going to get the full benefit of having the socks because you're on borrowed time. Rituals really are no different. Rituals are built on the laws of reciprocity. Reciprocity, let me give you an example of what that looks like. I know someone that, you might have heard me say this before, very close with this person. Everything that this person owns is hot. Hot goods. Everything. 
this person over time has collected so many different things from toiletries to groceries and all kinds of other things. This person now has a heart condition. I explained to this person, you know, by you making a decision to buy goods that were stolen, each one of those goods has spread the energy of chaos within your home, like a spore. You see what mold looks like when it starts to spread, right? Imagine that that energy is everywhere in your house. Soon, your walls would be black, dark, and damp, and dank. And then it would cause your respiratory system to eventually fail and be conflicted, right? That's what's happening to this person that I know very well. They have a very serious heart condition. And I told this person, if you get rid of all the hot goods from your home and you stop buying hot goods from indiscriminate people, you'll start to clear that up and the condition could possibly reverse back to homeostasis. So when we obtain things and we share certain things, especially rituals, that's not how it was intended to be. So I'm giving you a quick discourse in proper dissemination and usage of divine energies. You can't share your studentship with someone. You can't share your divine energy with someone unless you give it to them as a gift, but the endowment belongs to you. And you have to maintain that. So that's what the ritual is, guys, and it's very, very powerful. So it'll advance you. And when you look at the Buddha, you can ask him for one thing. I will also say, make sure that you, when you finish the fast, bring a gift. Get any kind of gift you want. It could be one of your favorite gold chains that you don't wear anymore. It could be three ripe mangoes. That's my personal gift that I love to give to Fortuna because she likes that. You can give them whatever is dear to you. Now, here's how you do it. You keep it by your bedside and you will take the astral version of the gift. And you will humbly offer it to the Buddha. And he'll respect that. And then you, in turn, can ask him a question about who you are or whatever you'd like. You can ask him how many lifetimes you're due to have on this planet. Or to uh, take you out of the cycle of samsara, which is being completely taken out of the cycle of life and death. Okay? Question, John? Yes. Uh, could you explain the difference between uh, couples and the rituals as opposed to the rituals you buy, when one person buys and one to share? What's the difference between the men the rituals and the men and whatever? The difference between, let's say, when we were in Las Vegas, there were three couples. Each couple I gave a certain ritual to to help strengthen the union of your union. So the difference is you and Delicia are together and you're both students. So you have my blessing to share whatever you like. If a student comes and their mate isn't a student, they do not have my blessing to share certain things unless I say X, Y, Z. Because literally just the thought of them doing that, and I haven't sanctioned it, will nullify the power of the ritual. It just won't work. And if it does work, it'll have an adverse repercussion behind it. It's like getting a backwards compliment with a slap, like how Wendy Williams does. <laughs> M. Tendris? What's the date on this? I will send you all an email and I will let you know. It does vary. It's supposed to be the first Taurus moon. I'm not exactly sure, but you guys will know in advance. Okay. It should be happening, it should be coming up at the end of April. Early May. May is the most powerful spiritual month on the calendar. And right, as Chainana was saying, I started speaking publicly a few years ago. Um, and I entitled the lectures May Miracles. 
and I was giving invitations to people to the WESAC festival back then and what three of the people ended up there and they were amazed at what they saw. It's a beautiful thing. All right. I want to get, I want to show this. Uh, yes, Cynthia Champion. That's a great question. What I would do if it's jewelry, I would put it on the altar and leave it there forever. If it's fruit, you could also take, let's say hypothetically, if it's a coconut, if you're going to go see Lord Ganesh, if you're going to see one of the gods, if it's perishable, keep it on your altar and you might be amazed to see that it will never decay. It will not decay if they've accepted the gift and if you've been effective in your concourse with them. So there are different ways to gauge that. When you give a gift to the gods, it belongs to them. Someone did ask me, I don't know who it was, they said, uh, if I put the earrings or I put a necklace around the statue of Kuan Yin and I take it and wear it, I said, well, it's not really a gift if you're doing that. So when you put it around Kuan Yin's neck, uh, expect never to wear it again because it really is a gift that you've given over to the gods. What you might get in return might amaze you. Test your awareness. What do you think that series of recordings was about? And this just happened very recently. Um, this is a cheap commercial, by the way, but <laughs> just want to share it with you. Any guesses? He was contacted and taught how to fly. Okay, he did say that. <laughs> he said that all right. Well, I think he was leaving, he was, the flying was him flying into a new part of his spirituality and him leaving behind, in leaving behind the spaceship, he was leaving behind things, at people and places in his life and going on his path mm -hmm. down that lawn to a new journey. Yes. Yeah. Right? That's so that's very eloquent. What I would say is that our parents who are gods do things sometimes in your life that it takes you or could take you a long time to catch up to what they did years ago. So the dream that he said he had where some being was teaching him how to fly was his divine parent. Only for him to come and be attracted to me and say, you know, I've been on your website and I've watched your videos and I just saw that divine beacon and it's really calling me. I've got to have it. Now, he paid $2,000 for the Divine Beacon. He got it. A week later, he has this dream, and you heard what he said. He heard a loud noise. He was at his friend's house, and he had a sensation of leaving a ship, but he saw a burning bush. What does all of that mean? There's a mythology about the burning bush that divinity was speaking to. He was at a friend's house. So what that means is that his divine parents gave him a projection and a dream to cover up the event that would be harmful to his consciousness. But he retained just enough to walk away with knowing that he had interface with a reptilian looking being. He was that same being was teaching him how to fly in the air. He felt he was leaving the ship. The reason that he didn't remember being on the ship was because his parents neuralized that. The neuralizer is a real thing. There are different ways to do it. So we'll give you just enough to keep you going. They also put into him, you must get that divine beacon so that you can have a safe interface with us. Lots of people ask me, well, how come I don't know who my divine parents are? Uh, I've been asking and nothing. There's a good reason for that. I'm going to give you an example that I just happened to be offered. You know, when I do these things and I find these videos, I'm not scouring YouTube to find a good way to articulate some things that happen. They're brought to me. Literally, they'll say, use that. Use that. 
Use that. So these are things that will help you to grow. When we use tools that come from the angels and the gods and we use technologies, it helps us to grow out of the pigeonhole that we live in. There are some people that are of the ilk, as my mother always says, the ilk, that God is in me and I can do anything. I don't need any teacher. I don't need anything. And okay, let me know how, how far you get. <laughs> let me know how that works out for you. Because if that were totally true, the creator would not have sent. He wouldn't have created the angels as galactic coordinates and the creators of the stars. He would not have sent prophets to give you higher messages. He wouldn't have appointed certain gods. Now, I'm talking about the creator and gods, right? So the creator appoints the gods and what they're going to do in the universe and other universes. He gives them instructions on how to grow the lower worlds. A lot of tools and different teachings and codes and modalities and technologies come from that intelligence. So when we look at it and we ignore it, we're making a statement that we're not really trying to participate in something that will emancipate us greatly. If you go back to Egypt, there was a slide that I have in the AGA. I don't know if I put it in here, but I had a slide of Hathor, Lord Toth, or Tehuti, and Asar. And all of them are holding cosmic beacons in their hand. That's the reason why I keep it kind of veiled until people get it, activate it, and have the experience themselves. Then they'll know what it is. Are there any questions about that before I move forward? What is the cosmic beacon? The cosmic beacon is a device that alerts your divine parents that you're ready to wake up, in a nutshell. The divine beacon is different because it has the power of 22 gods that work with the Galacticus. It also projects your future directly into your reality. So if you sleep with it, you will see things about your future and know how to utilize what's going to happen or see the possibilities of all the things that could happen. That's what it is. Can I say something about that too? Yes. <clears throat> Many of you yesterday in your sessions, remember we talked about beacons that you had, mm -hmm. etheric beacons? Okay, so at one time you had a physical beacon and then you left that physical lifetime, but the valence of that beacon is still with you. So that's what he's talking about. It's so powerful, it's actually going to transcend this lifetime and, we'll, and it'll remain in your aura, it'll remain in your etheric field mm -hmm. throughout all, the rest of your incarnations. Thank you. I also have to say that a lot of you are my students from ages ago. And some of you were in the mystery schools. Some of you, and I said this in Vegas, but I didn't go into detail. The first time I went to London, I met a woman named Sheena. And she's a white woman from London. And she would not leave my side after the workshop. She would follow me around and ask me all these questions. And I'm like, you know, I have to go to the bathroom now, so you might want to stay right there. <laughs> and um, I gave her some energy. So the next day she came back because it was a three-day symposium. And she says, Gano, I know you're not going to believe this, but um, oh, let me rewind. When I gave her the energy, she automatically, her soul came out of her body. There's a video on YouTube. You've seen a woman that went like this, and then I had to put her back inside and when she came back the next day, she said, Gano, I had a vision that you were bringing me back to life or you have brought me back to life many times. And I said, oh, okay. I had to go and meditate on that one. And I was shown a vision. She was one of my students that I told to jump off of a cliff. I saw her ask me, um, am I going to die? I said, you have to find out yourself. 
In the mystery schools, <laughs> in the mystery schools, we. Like that. Yeah. You guys are so lucky. Eras where we had to do stuff like that. Just yeah. like the Matrix. Just like the Matrix. It's yeah. Like, and it's like now, even in our lifetimes, in, in these last three generations, we've crossed the, the border of not needing to do contracts the way we used to do them. So when I look at Soul Records, a lot of the contracts you've made light up because they want you to see it and they want you to deactivate it because it's no longer appropriate and it's holding you back. So that's the benefit of having this information because the things that are most important and pertinent to you will be highlighted and known to you as a resource, right? So back to Sheena, I had a very clear look at me telling her to jump off of a cliff because she was an aspirant. An aspirant is someone who waits a very long time to get into the mystery schools. So she had some trepidation, but she jumped off the cliff and died. So I brought it back to life. And I said, you know, that was a good jump, but you had some doubt in there. Let's do it again. So we went back to the cliff, jump off the cliff. She jumps off the cliff, she dies again. Bring it back to life. You know, you jumped off the cliff, but you, you had a little more doubt this time. <laughs> Let's take a week off. I want you to fast and I want you to do these hekau and some divine utterance and then come back. So she came back again. So you ready to jump off the cliff? Let's go. So she jumps off the cliff, and guess what happened? Better. Well, a few things happened. The first time, she stopped in midair. And then she blinked, and she was back on the cliff. I said, okay, that was interesting. You want to see something else? Because your fear is starting to really subside. Jump off the cliff again and see what happens. So she jumps off the cliff, and guess what happens this time? She flew. No, you got this. Is too easy. She disappeared. No, she instantly landed in a future lifetime. And I was there waiting for her, like, good job. <laughs> Snap the fingers, and she goes back. Jump off the cliff again. Yes. yes. She jumps off the cliff again. What happens this time? For a split nano millisecond, nanosecond like Mamie, she, she loves that science stuff. She gets a glimpse into the primordial kingdom where her soul was created. Wow. That nanosecond seemed like two days. She became an adept and she became a master. And one of you are that people. No, I'm just kidding. Oh. <laughs> I should have let that linger a little while longer. You <laughs> so that was the vision that she had. Her name is Sheena. So back to this. The divine beacon is something that comes with a full consultation. It comes with yearly codes, which means that there is a calendar of certain equinoxes and certain rituals that you'll have to do or that you can do. One of them is the Wezak Festival. Full divine lineage, where not only do you make contact with your divine parent, but you will make contact with all of them. What does that mean? Let's take the god Tehuti. It's not the only God that he was. He was Hermes. He was Lord Toth. He was Abraxas. He was Quetzalcoatl. And he's been on this planet many times. Some people say, well, how is that possible? Well, let's say somebody who's 40 years old in a room. You're not the same person you were 
20 years ago. You might even have a different nickname. And you're definitely not the same person you were at birth. The gods live a very long time. And they don't keep the same identity. They incarnate in different pantheons. Or they walk into different pantheons. And they assume that. That's not something we could fully understand either. Because we have human consciousness. So now I want to talk about divine consciousness and human consciousness. Divine consciousness is a part of you that you don't normally use. A lot of you don't believe that it even exists. But there are things that you need to do in order to draw that divine consciousness into your body. I want to talk about the first cycle of the studentship program because the first thing that I have all of my students do is... give energy to their I am. And Mamie could talk about this. This is one of the reasons why Mamie and I are so close. My I am, the same decrees that I have all of you guys do for that first month are the same ones that I use to meet that part of myself. Mamie saw what my I am looks like. My I am came right down and said, I need to speak to Gano. And we were on the phone, and she said, Gano, uh, <laughs> your I am is here. And I'm like, really? What does he look like? He's like, really? He's huge. He's, do you want to tell it, or do you want me to tell it? Cause I, you tell it better than me. Ah, uh, okay. <laughs> so Mamie says he's like golden, and he looks just like you. He wants to talk to you. He's very big, though. Much bigger. Much bigger. So I'm like, okay. So I get on the phone. 